Yo, what's going on snipers and welcome back to our National Predators Throwback 2000 franchise mode here in NHL 24. So in last episode, we had kind of an interesting playoff round with the Dallas Stars. It was our first ever playoff matchup in franchise history. And uh, yeah, it was a little bit of an interesting series because as you can see, we lost game one seven to one. So not a great start to our playoff success. Then we won two nothing. So it was a tie series and it looked like, hey, maybe this could be the type of series that could go back and forth or we could start to win some more games. Well, the next game we lost six to five in overtime. So another game where we didn't play the best defensively. Then we lost 2-1, to one and we were down 3-1 to one. at that point. I wasn't thinking we were going to be able to rally because Dallas is a pretty well-built-up team. However, since they had an injury to Ed Belfour, it helped us out in a sense that we won the next three games. As you can see, 3-2, to two, so one goal victory. A 2-1 victory, so another one goal victory. And in Game 7, we also won by one goal, scoring 5-4. to four. So uh, those last three games, we managed to close out those closed games, and we managed to take them out in seven games after being down 3-1. Next uh, episode, which is this episode, we're going to be taking on the Calgary Flames. And Calgary is kind of an interesting team as well. They're not necessarily the best on paper. They technically finished worse than us in the standings, 40-36, 5-1. However, they are 8-2 going into the playoffs, which is a little bit scary now. Their roster on paper really is kind of constricted in a weird way. Like, they do have quite the weakness, but they also have some very good strengths too. You can see with like their top line, obviously having like Jerome McGinley, having guys like Mark Savard, Christian Huselius, Jeff Shantz, Valerie Burry is great, but you can see that obviously the glaring problem is that left-hand side. Having Steve Bajan as a second line forward is very, very weird because obviously in real life, Steve Bajan was a career like fourth line forward, maybe sometimes a third line forward, but he was never a top six type of guy. Oleg Saprikin is still generating some growth, but he should be able to get into that second line role at some point, my guess. And then there's also Rico Fado, who's more of a third line kind of guy as well at best. But uh, Sergei Krivokrasov, in my opinion, should be kind of maybe their uh, second line left winger. But they're using him as the right winger, which is his actual position, so that's at least good. But uh, in general, this team has quite the weakness on that left side. And then also, in terms of centers at the moment, Jordan Leopold is playing center because they do actually have an injury at the moment to a goal, uh, to a center, I think it was. Yeah, it was Jason Botterill. He actually plays left wing, but he would probably be their fourth line center. So uh, Jordan Leopold is having to play center for the first few games of the series, which should be interesting to see what that fourth line does with a defenseman as a fourth line center. So that will be interesting to see on that. What's interesting is I didn't even think Jordan Leopold actually started the series off in Anaheim and then he must have got dealt to Calgary. Yeah, he must have signed with Calgary or got dealt to Calgary because technically in real life he uh, also had that same result where he didn't even actually get the play game with the Ducks because he was already dealt to Calgary by then. So I think he must have got dealt early on. Maybe I noticed that in a few episodes back, but I don't remember to be honest. Uh, so this is his first taste of NHL playoff action. He only played three regular season games this year and he's played four playoff games already. So... Uh, he's definitely not experienced at all, so that might also help us out a little bit. But obviously, containing a Gimla, Safar, Chance, Bure is going to be definitely a tough task for our team. From a defensive standpoint, you can see they're pretty balanced. It's not really super weak defensively. They don't have a super stud defenseman. Derek Morris is good, but uh, I wouldn't say they obviously have that stud defender, like, say, like a Chris Pronger or something like that, that can make a big difference. And then goalie-wise, they do have J.S. Jaguar, though, so they do have the good goaltending combination. It'll be interesting to see what Jay Shager can do against us because technically this is a 102. Jay Shager obviously went to the Cup Finals in 2003 with the Ducks and obviously he won a Stanley Cup by 2007. So it will be interesting to see if he could win one actually around that same time frame. So yeah, it will be an interesting second round to see if our team is actually able to get to the conference finals. Like I said, I'm not holding my breath too much because I'm not really trying to go super far in this playoff run, obviously. But if we do, that's okay because obviously we could blow it up a little bit more in the offseason and hope for a good pick in next year's draft. But anyways, let's get into your guys' comments now and see what you guys have to say about last episode. And then we'll get into the second round against the Calgary Flames and see what this team could do. So the first comment is from Senator Taku. says, The American Airlines Center is in Dallas. American Airlines Arena is where the Miami Heat played, but it's now called Kaseya Center now. So that's where I was getting confused. I, for some reason, though, I don't know how I remember that there was an American Airlines Arena, though, too, because I haven't watched a Miami Heat basketball game probably since they were in, like, the finals, like, a few years ago. I probably watched, like, one game, but 
honestly have not even done anything in like NBA 2K with the Miami Heat in a while, so kind of surprised that uh, that uh, was still somehow lodged in my memory. The next two comments are from Jared the Rabbit. The first one says, the Pairs have played in the same building since its inception, and yes, I kind of know that because I'm pretty sure it went from like Gaylord Entertainment Center to the Sawmint Center, if I'm not mistaken, and then afterwards it's when it changed to Bridgestone, which it currently is if I'm not mistaken, and there might have been another arena or two in there, but I'm pretty sure that's the only three arenas, and obviously the Nenersville Predators have only been playing since 98-99, so uh, probably that is correct, because I can't see them changing the name as often as like the Florida Panthers, for instance, because Florida Panthers have changed their arena names and changed arenas so many times that it's almost for easy to forget which arenas they played in and whatnot, because they've had like BB and T Bank and all these bank names, and they're at like Emirates Center now or whatever it's called. I don't even know at this point, but they've definitely changed their name more frequently than any other team, I'm pretty certain, on that. Jared also says, damn, the Flames do not have any left wing or center depth. And yeah, they don't really have any depth whatsoever to that side. Obviously, the right side they do. Uh, but obviously, playing Jordan Leopold as a fourth line center because of an injury is quite a weird scenario. Uh, Jason Botterill also doesn't even play center, so technically they're going to be using a winger as a center whenever, obviously, that uh, Botterill is back. So they don't have that great center depth. And then their left wing depth, obviously, playing Steve Bejan as a top six center, or not top six center, top six left winger is a very weird thing because, like I said, he's more of a career fourth-line type of guy. So for him to be up in a top-six role with guys like Jerome McGinley is very, very strange. However, they managed to get out of the first round against a tough Ducks team, so there's a chance that they obviously could beat us even with that lack of depth. And the last and final comment is from Flame Husky, who just puts a bunch of, I think they're Sabertooth emojis or Tiger emojis. I honestly have no idea what they are, but... Uh, Thank you for those comments, guys, and uh, yeah, let's see if we could beat these Calgary Flames, because obviously if they knocked out the Ducks, they definitely have a way that they could beat teams. I actually should look at their player stats through round one. Maybe that's something I should start doing in episodes, is taking a look at player stats for the team we're going up against as well, so we can kind of see who's actually been doing well for them going into the matchup. So, if we look at forwards at the moment, leading away for them is Burre, Savard, Chance, Justin Williams is up there as well. Jerome McGinley surprisingly isn't the leading point guy, but he does have uh, three goals so far. But Justin Williams already has five goals in the playoffs, living up to that uh, Mr. Game 7 scenario. If we go to a Game 7 and Justin Williams score, that uh, will be quite strange. But Steve Bajan's actually been doing well as a top six guy. It must be because there's some really good players on that uh, top six. But he only had three shots in six games, but scored on two of them. So Steve bajan has been actually pretty good in that top six role. This is actually his first NHL season as well after playing a number of years with the St. John's Flames. Wow, he only had two goals in 21 regular season games, but in six playoff games, he's got two goals. Hmm. That's very strange. And then Botterill played two games before he got injured. So there's that. And in terms of goaltenders, J.S. Shiger is rocking a 917 at the moment. So... We'll see if we're able to obviously find a way to beat Jesh Aguirre because he could be a difference maker in the series as well because that's a good starting goalie compared to what Ilya Burzgalov was in last round. So let's see if we could find a way to win ourselves a second round. Like I said, it doesn't matter too much if we win this round because obviously we're trying for better draft picks and stuff like that in next year's draft so we could blow it up a bit in the offseason. But this is going to be quite the task to take on Jerome McGinley. Since we're in 0102, hopefully Detroit ends up winning the Stanley Cup if we don't. Like, I could feel like a Detroit New Jersey Stanley Cup finals could happen in the series. So, like a rematch in 95, I could definitely see that. So, we'll see if that ends up happening if we do get eliminated. But, anyways, game number one on home ice. Can we find a way to get ourselves an early series lead here? We've won three straight games. Can we win more on top of that? First period. 2 nothing Flames, Jerome McGinley, Christian Hughes alias. Kind of as expecting, Jerome McGinley was going to start off on a good note. He scores 25 seconds in, and then Christian Hughes alias scores as well. So, as I was expecting, we need to kind of contain that top line if we want to have a chance to win. And their top line gets going early, which is not really a great sign, especially when we're on home ice. Shots are 13-9 in favor of us, but we're down by a pair of goals. Can we find a way to get back into this game? Second period. Four nothing flames. Ooh, far winning streaks definitely coming to an end here. Shant scores to make it three nothing, and Tony Ludman scores at nine seconds left in the period. We are out shooting him thirty to fifteen, yet we're down four nothing. So Vokun's not playing great 
Our offense is generating chances, but not finding ways to score. Like I said before in last round, I think our, our teams offensively, we're not going to score a ton of goals, so we need to be able to keep pucks out of the net, and then we can win games like 2-1 or 3-2 or something like that. But if we're giving up 4-plus goals and we're not scoring, there's almost no way we're coming back in these type of games. So let's see what happens in period 3, see if we could at least get a goal to maybe give our fans something to cheer about going into next game. But... This is definitely not a great way to start off the second round, but I definitely feel like this is the type of round we'll definitely lose in because we knocked out a good Dallas team as Mark Savard makes it 5 nothing with a power play goal against. Uh, not a great game for this team. We do get a lot of shots. We outshot them 38-27, to but we lose 5 to nothing because we don't really have that offensive like pile dr or not pile driver, uh, driver on our team, I should say. I don't even know why I'm trying to say pile driver. Not even watching the WWE here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. The Flames top line definitely went to work. A lot of our top guns went to work. Uh, Tony Lubin picking up his first goal of the playoffs apparently as well. But, yeah, that's not great for our team to start off this round. A lot of guys minus in this game. Hal Gill and Mike Wilson are both a minus three. And then an 8.15 save percentage from Thomas Vokun. And then, of course, J.S. Shiger shuts us out with 38 saves. Yeah, J.S. Shiger, like I said, could definitely be a difference maker in the series. He gets first star, Aginla the second star, and Mark Savard the third star. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see if Jerome Aginla could win a Stanley Cup in the series. Because, obviously, in real life, uh, got there in 04 to the finals. Unfortunately, lost to Tampa Bay. So, it'll be interesting to see if he could actually win a Stanley Cup for a change. And, ooh, San Jose's up 1-0 on Dal or Detroit already. Hmm. That's an interesting one. I wonder what San Jose is looking like at this point. Probably Owen Nolan stole in that type of thing. But uh, I think I'm going to... Should I make adjustments after one game? Since I don't really care too much about where we finish in this playoff run, let's just keep the team the same for game two. But obviously, if we lose that type of game again by a score of like 5 nothing or something, I will probably make some adjustments headed to Calgary. So let's see what happens in game two. See if Fokun can have a good response Last uh, round, we had a bad first game, but then we had a great second game. Because game one of last round against Dallas, we lost 7-1. to one, So, it could ha be the same type of thing where we all of a sudden play really good in game two. Let's see what happens first period. Scoreless, I'll take it. I mean, we haven't scored in four straight periods, which is a bit concerning. But, I mean, it's a better defensive period. So, that's at least good. Shots are 10-8 to eight in favor of us, but nobody has scored so far. Can we find a way to break this deadlock? Second period. One nothing Flames. We have not scored in six straight periods to start this second round. Yeah, J.S. Shiger has definitely been a difference maker so far as Valerie Burray scores. Shots are 21-18 in favor of us, and we have not to score, uh, yet to score so far in the series. Their top guns are going, and we just can't find ways to score on Jaguar. That's not great. I don't know if we're going to be able to win a single game in the series at this rate, but we'll see what happens in this third period. See if we can get our first goal of the series and tie this one up. Come on, boys. Let's see if we can get a goal. Just We need one or two, and then we can win this game. We're still in it, so just got to play good defensively and find a way to get our offense going. Power play for us. It's a long power play. We do not score on it. Our offense is completely drying up here. Jeez, yeah, we're just like a pure defensive team, and we are going to get shut out in back-to-back -back games to start the second round. Yo, we're going to get swept, and we're going to be only scoring like one goal in the series or something like that. We outshot them again, 37-26, but Jay Shiger's been a complete brick wall in this playoffs, and we just cannot find ways to score goals. The only goal is Burry from Derek Morris. Wow. At least Vokun had a big response from last game, but still kind of sucks that he gets credited with the loss because our team didn't score a single goal. Back-to-back -back first stars of the game for J.S. Shiger, Vokun the second star, and Valerie Burry the third star. Yeah, we're definitely making some adjustments to try and find ways to score some goals. Apparently Scott Walker was injured. Yep, fractured left elbow. He will be out till May the 27th. Let me just go replace player for the time being, but we are going to have to make some adjustments anyways, but... Losing Scott Walker is not exactly a great thing, especially considering we're down 2 0 in the series at this point. San Jose is actually up 2 0 on Detroit at the moment, so that's kind of intriguing. Like I said, I would prefer Detroit winning the Stanley Cup this year for realism purposes, but oh well. Let's go Sully on the first line. Let's go Valchevic on the second line. And we'll go Mike Watt on this line. Sure. I don't really care too much. 
at this rate. Defensively, we were okay defensively last game, but let's make a small little adjustment for chemistry purposes. And then, yeah, Thomas Vokun will stop, probably still start in net. We could always start Rick DiPietro, but I would prefer to wait on DiPietro a little bit. But yeah, losing Scott Walker is a massive blow to this team's offense. Not that we were getting much offense to begin with in the series anyways, so maybe that will help us in a sense, but... We're down 2-0, losing both home games, not scoring a single goal in those two games. So now we're going to need to find ways to score in Calgary, which might be even tougher than it was on home ice because we don't have our fans behind us necessarily. So let's get into game three and see if we can find a way to win at least one game in Calgary. Because at this rate, I feel like we're going to get swept and we're barely going to score any goals. But never know what could happen in game three. So first period of game three. And we are not scored in seven straight periods. Oh my god. This is maybe the longest goal drought I've seen. Seven straight periods without a goal. You could definitely tell this is the early 2000s and like the dead puck era and stuff like that. Jeez. So Jeff Chance opens the scoring. Christian Huselius makes it 2 nothing. Shots are 11-7 to in favor of the Flames. So we're actually getting a shot after one. But we have no goal still in this series. Who wants to be the first guy to score in the series? Because everybody has just all of a sudden decided to like check out completely. Like, do we play like a trap system where we just don't try offensively? Like, we dump and chase or what? Like, this is one of the weirdest series I've seen in quite a while. So, do we have a goal in us in the second period? Or are we going to go eight straight periods without scoring? Let's see what happens in this next 20 minutes. Second period. Hey, we finally score two goals of our own, but, I mean, we're still losing, which is not a great thing. Andreas Johansson, the first guy to score for us in the series, and then Rob Valachevic made it a 2-2 game. So it was a tied game for a little bit, but only less than a minute later, Derek Morris gets the lead back for the Flames, and a late power play goal from Jerome McGinley is not the type of goal you want to give up. Shots are 28-20 in favor. The Flames are down by a pair of goals. Going into the third, do we have any goals in us in the third period to try and get this game back to square? Or are we going to be flirting with a chance to being swept? Let's see what happens in this third period. Come on, guys. We got two goals in the last period. Can we get any more in this game? Or is this going to be another game where we just don't score enough? Derek Morris makes it 5-2. to two. Yeah, I think we're going to get swept in this round. But that's what happens probably when you knock out a team that you probably shouldn't have. Like, that Dallas Stars team should have probably beat us easily. But then we won three straight games. And the Calgary Flames have us by the balls. We're down 3-0 now in this series, losing 5-2. Outshot 34-31. We only had two goals in one period. So that means technically we've had eight scoreless periods in this series. And we've only scored our two goals in that second period of Game 3. Ah, great. So our only goals were Johansson from Timonen and Sullivan, Valchevic from Legwand and Nagy. Damn, man. This is tough. Three stars a game. McGinley, Derek Morris, and J.S. Jaguar. Once again, a three star of the, a third star of the game, or a first, well, a star of the game, I should say. I don't even know. Well, we're going to have to pull off some miracle as Mike Wilson has now been injured, so that's a defenseman. Let's just go replace throughout this stage, but Last round, we came back from a 3-1 deficit. This time around, we need to come back from a 3-0 deficit. Looks like the Calgary Flames are going to be going to the conference finals. And it looks like they might be playing the San Jose Sharks unless Detroit can pull off the reverse sweep of their own. New Jersey looks like they're going to the conference finals. Not a surprise. And it could be the Florida Panthers or Philadelphia still at this point in time. Do I want to make any adjustments for our roster? We were getting outscored a total of 11-2 after three games. I think we're just going to go best lines for this last game, potentially, of the series. Because at this point, we might as well just uh, trust in the coach. But we're definitely going to make a lot of adjustments this offseason with who we're flipping away and all that. So, yeah, we're going best lines. Who's in the scratch? Just Dennis Arkipov. That's okay, I guess. Yeah, we bring in the face puncher and Kote again. That's okay, too. Hmm. And this is probably uh, Johansson's last game with the Nashville Predators. Could also be maybe Greg Johnson's and some other guys. But I don't really know who I will flip away in the offseason still. But obviously some of these guys definitely will be back here next year. Like Hartnell's getting first line time now in this game. Nagy, Steve Sullivan will be back for sure. But obviously if we want to tank for next year's draft, we might have to trade away players that we don't really want to. 
All right, can we survive and not get swept in the second round, or are we going to get swept after we came back from a 3-1 deficit against a tough Dallas Stars team? Let's see what happens. Real-time simulation. Can we fight off elimination and survive another day? We have yet to score a first period power uh, goal, and we do get one here. Sebastian Bordolo on the power play. We get another power play chance, but we do not capitalize on that one. Another power play, but we don't capitalize on it. So the refs are giving us some chances on the power play in this one. But Bordolo has the goal so far. So at least we have a first period goal. That has not happened at all in the series. And of course, we give up a late goal. It is Valerie Bure once again. So yeah, that top six of the Flames... Definitely is uh, a threat, and we can't really contain it, it seems like. Shots are 13-13. It's a 1-1 game after 20 minutes. Let's see what happens in the second period. See if we can grab that lead back. Power play for us. And we do score another power play goal, and it's Valchevic. Okay, but Christian Huselius answers back with a power play goal of his own for the Flames. Hmm. Come on, boys. Let's get that lead back. At least we've scored two goals in back-to-back -back games, but we are not consistent at all with our offense for sure. And it's going to be a tie game going into the third. Shots are 22-20 in favor of the Flames. It's a 2-2 game after two. So many twos again. Can we find a way to get that lead back in the third period? Because right now it's been back and forth. I want to survive at least one game if possible. It would be nice to take one game of the series, but it's going to be very tough because our team's not consistent. So... Third period underway. Is this the last period of our season? Maybe. Jerome Ginla opens the scoring in the period. Greg Johnson answers back because he says, hey, I want to survive another day. Penalty kill. Nicely done by our penalty killers. Another penalty kill. We killed that off. Power play for us. We do not score on it. A lot of power plays in this game for both teams. Final few minutes here of game four. Are we going to overtime? Yes, we are. We're going to be going to overtime to try and save our season Shots are 37-31 in favor of the Flames. It's been back and forth so far. If we score the next goal, we survive another day. If they score, obviously they're off to the conference finals. Who wants to be the hero for us? Let's call on Hartnell. Let's say it's going to be Hartnell because he's the future of this team. Come on, Hartnell. I believe in you, man. I just feel like it would be Hartnell of all people if it was somebody on our team. At least this is our best offensive game of this series so far. And oh no, the Flames win in overtime. Maxavad sends the Flames to the conference finals. We have been swept in round two. And Calgary will likely be taking on the San Jose Sharks. Or they could be taking on Detroit. Who knows in the conference finals. Damn, that sucks. So the Flames get into the conference finals a few years early. Uh, but at least that was our best offensive game, but still definitely stings to get swept, especially after what we did to Dallas uh, when we were down 3-1. to one. We could have been taken out in five games last round, but instead we get swept in the second round. So Bordalo from Valachevic and Johansson, Valachevic from Bordalo, Greg Johnson from Sullivan and Hartnell, but unfortunately, Mark Savard's game-winning goal has ended the series. Hmm. Yeah, we just were not consistent with the offensive load. And then our goaltending was a little bit inconsistent too, which kind of sucks. But uh, Savard, the first star, Hughes Haley, second star, Jerome Aguila, the third star of the game. Hmm. Yeah, that was a very quiet series for our team. Giving up a total of 15 goals in four games, which is not really ideal. And only scoring a total of five goals in four games. <laughs> Yeah, our team is definitely needing more offense to it, and that's exactly what I kind of expected with this team. Like, our team is definitely more of a defensive team, so we need to start drafting those guys that could help out our offense, because, or else our team's going to be just like one of those teams that needs to win games like 2-1 to one or 3-2, like I was mentioning earlier. But let's take a look at our player stats after the second round. So, Greg Johnson on 8 points, but minus 6. Oof, yeah, the plus minuses on this team are very not great. Legwand had no goals in the playoffs, as did Arkipov. Okay. Um, Johansson. Yeah, nobody on this team really was that great. Like, there was some good offensive numbers, but uh, the plus-minus, not great. That second round, we didn't score enough. So, yeah, we need to be much better in the future, but at least it was a good little taste of playoff action for this team. We only had two plus defenders. They were our top six pairing of Tamander and Skrastens. Everybody else was minus. Hal Gill was a minus 11, which is dreadful. And then goaltending-wise, yeah, Vokun had an 899. Hmm. 
Wow, okay. So there is our player stats after the second round. Now the question is who is going to win the Stanley Cup and all that in 2102? Is Detroit going to find a way to somehow survive against San Jose? Who knows? It's probably not going to happen, but we'll see who ends up winning the Stanley Cup. We're definitely going to have a different champion in, in real life, my guess, but we'll see what happens. Let's just go best lines because that doesn't matter too much at this point. Who is going to be the Cup champion for 02? Who is it going to be? Hey, we got an achievement. What is that? Coaching royalty. Have a coach. I thought I already had that achievement. I definitely have had that achievement, haven't I? I'm pretty certain on that, but anyways. Stanley Cup champion, the Florida Panthers get it done. Which is interesting, because obviously in real life they could win their first cup right now. But the Quebec Citadels win the Calder Cup, but Florida winning a Stanley Cup in 2002. That's cool, actually. Yeah, that's kind of neat. Because Tampa in this series probably won't win the cup in 04, so a Florida team winning in 02, I don't mind it. I do not mind it. Let's take a look at that playoff tree. It was a Florida-Calgary Stanley Cup final, so it's almost like Tampa-Calgary, but a couple years early. Since, yeah, Florida's going to be more of like Tampa would be in real life but at this point, I guess. That's kind of neat. That's kind of neat. I will take it. But the Calgary Flames going to the cup finals, knocking out the San Jose Sharks in seven games in that conference finals. Yeah, I'll definitely take it. That's pretty neat. Who was on that Florida team, though, to win that Stanley Cup? Because I'm curious if there was any new players that we were not expecting. Let's see. Let's go by centers. Starting off with Robert Reichel. 27 points. Kozlov up there, 25 points. Rob Niedemeyer even had 21 points. Jason Weimer, Len Berry. All right. They also still had Ray Whitney. Corey Stillman was there a little bit early. Oleg Kavasha, but he was injured apparently in that last game of that cup finals, it looks like. Uh, right wing wise, Pavel Bray was there, of course, 25 points. Scott Mellenby on 14. Mark Parrish up there with 12. Marcus Nilsson with 8. And then defensively, Robert Shvela, Yaroslav Spotchek, Dan Boyle, now in the NHL, Paul Laus, Brett Hedekin, Daryl Shannon, and Lance Ward. And then goaltending-wise, Trevor Kidd and Tommy Salo. So that Florida team has just won the Stanley Cup. Pretty damn good depth scoring, I would say, especially with all these guys in their top six, it looks like. Shvela definitely helps them out defensively, too, so... That is your Stanley Cup champion winning roster, just in case you guys wanted to take a look at what they looked like. How good they did they finish during the season? Because I don't remember where they were finished in terms of the entire league. Uh, they were a top 10 team. They actually finished below us in the standings. They won their division, but they won the Stanley Cup. So we could have maybe won the Stanley Cup this year, but we didn't have that offensive talent to drive us to that cup win. Let's take a look at these individual awards and stuff. So Florida winning the Stanley Cup in 2001-02. And then the President's Trophy this year was to the Montreal Canadiens. A Pavel Bray wins the Art Ross, not a surprise really. And the Hart, Bray's a cheat code in this still. Ren, uh, not Rene Bork. Why did I almost say Rene Bork? Ray Bork wins his second Norris. If Rene Bork won a Norris, that would be confusing as hell. Ray Whitney wins the Lady Bing. Appleby for Montreal wins to Calder. Ray Whitney wins the Con Smythe as well. That's kind of interesting. Patrick Wall, the Vesna. We also had Broder winning his first Jennings of the series. Ivan Mayeski, the Bill Masterton. Nashville's head coach, that's our head coach, obviously, winning the Jack Adams. So, at this point, that would be Barry Trotz, I guess, right? Yeah, Barry Trotz would have been the head coach. I, I know that for sure, almost at this point. So, Barry Trotz winning a Jack Adams in 2002. Uh, Adam Oates, the Selkie. Pavel Bray, the Lindsay. And, of course, also the Richard. AHL-wise, looks like Mikhail Anderson won a couple of awards. Michael Ryder had the most goals. Martin Erat, the best rookie in the AHL for us, so that's cool. Erat might be NHL bound soon. I like to see that. Greg Hogwood, the best defenseman. Rob Tallis, the best goaltender. Uh, Michael Ryder also won was the MVP for the Citadels in the playoffs. Mikhail Anderson again. Jeff Finley. Martin Gerber. And that's pretty much it, I think. Yep. So there is the awards. I almost wanted to go back to the NHL. Looks like 64 points from Erat this year, which is kind of nice. But there is the Stanley Cup champions for 2002 and all that stuff. Well, let's take a look at all this offseason stuff. See who retires in 2002. See where we're drafting, which obviously we're just normally drafting in our normal spot. But the Atlanta Thrashers have won the draft lottery sweepstakes. Tampa has two. New York Rangers number three. Vancouver four. And the Boston Bruins at five. Hmm. Okay, so Atlanta has first overall. 
Obviously, we know Duncan Keith is projected. I think it was to go second overall, but let's see the retirements. Ooh, some pretty big retirements this year. Let's start off with the centers, though. Mark Messier is hanging them up at uh, 42. Igor Larionov as well. Mark Biro. He doesn't matter too much, though. Mike Stapleton, Bob Basson, Michael Pafonka. Some other guys that are actual still players. Left wing wise, Gary Volk has decided to retire. Murray Craven, Dave Lowry. So that's Adam Lowry's dad. Uh, Paul Ranheim, Bob Probert has retired at 37. Um, and I think that is almost oh, not at Mike Eagles as well. Can't forget about the Mike Eagles. Uh, right wing wise, though, the big one, Brett Hull has decided to call it quits at 37. 100 goals, 232 points in 246 games. Ron Stern also retires, or Ronnie Stern. Tony Granato retires, Brian Noonan, and then Blair Chainham, and that's it for Fords. From a defensive standpoint, best defenseman retire, Ray Bork has decided to retire, and he did not win a Stanley Cup, I'm pretty sure, in the series, so that's unfortunate. But Ray has high, decided to retire with two Norris trophies at the end of his career, 202 points, 236 games. Steve Duchesne also retiring. That's also a pretty big defenseman. Paul Coffey as well, another great defenseman. Chris Chelios retiring way early. So uh, four defenders, three of which are in the Hall of Fame. Steve Duchesne is not a Hall of Famer, but he still was a solid defenseman. Uh, so that's quite the retirement list. Also, Don Sweeney retires the same year that Ray Bork does. Makes sense considering those two were defensive pairing guys for quite a while. Ken Danico retires with the Rangers, which is weird. J.J. Deneau retires too. Uh, Jeff Finley retires in the AHL, as does Lance Pitlick. And that is it for defenders. Goalie-wise, no goalies. Only Matt Murray's dead body, basically. <laughs> uh, what else we got? In terms of retirements, in terms of coaches, did we lose anybody? Does not look like it. No. All right. So there's that. Ken Danico is now a scout. That's interesting. I don't know if Ken Danico ever got into scouting, but I feel like he would be the type of guy to get into scouting. I got to take a look at that for a second. Let me see. Make sure I did not change scenes. Okay, good. Let me just look up Ken Danico and see if he ever got into scouting or coaching or anything like that. Because I feel like that guy was a great leader for the Devils back in the day. So if he did become a scout or something, I would not be surprised. But I don't think he did. Let's see. Does he have a staff profile? No, he does not. So I guess he didn't do anything after his hockey career. That's kind of surprising, to be honest, though. Because like I said, he was a really, like, he was a kind of like the leadership type of guy for the Devils for a long time. All right, so there's that. Okay, so final few things to wrap up this 2002 season. We got to take a look at the progress reports, the contract situation, and the draft class. Let's take a look at our progress reports to start off with. See who got some growth, who dropped off. Looks like a lot of statistical growth from this team because Greg Johnson's definitely not an 88 overall. So, yeah, that's kind of crazy. It looks like he might have generated some actual X-Factors too, which is kind of neat. Uh, but um, David Leguan up to an 82. Got a lot of growth. Rick DiPietro should be maybe a starter next season. Who knows? Um, not a lot of growth from everybody else, though. In the system-wise, Dan Ellis is up to a 69 at 22. Definitely taking his time to develop, but he could still make it for sure. Definitely an AHL serviceable goalie at least. Uh, Schubert's up to a 61. Svatos up to a 68. John Scott up to a 64. Orpik up to a 70. Okay. Erat up to a 76. Jay McLennan is a 68. Sedin, that elite goalie, is up to a 66. Wow. That's an exciting one. Jared Smithson a 71. Nathan Robertson, 65. Looks like we're getting pretty good growth from a lot of our prospects, which is very exciting. I don't know how much of them will make the NHL, but looks like for sure, at least. Oh, yeah, and Jason Spezza didn't get any growth. Uh, that's not a great. So maybe we want to sign him to his ELC and get him into the NHL because he probably should have got some growth, but he didn't get a single touch of growth as a medium elite, which is not great. So, hmm, does he join us in the NHL next season? We don't want a really great pick next year, so maybe not. Uh, but we also have Martin Erat, who could jump maybe to the NHL soon. Everybody else not too sure on. A lot of these guys probably AHL bound. So there is our progress reports. Contract situation wise. What do we got in terms of contracts? Who is up for renewal again? Oh yeah, the big one is Kimo Timonen. So Kimo Timonen, do we bring him back? I would say probably bring him back for a couple years. But obviously he's a pricey defenseman. But 
He's also only 27, so I would probably hold on to him for a while longer. But the rest of these guys, like Tom Fitzgerald, do we bother bringing them back at this age? Probably not. David Legwan obviously will come back as he's an RFA, but guys like him, Skrastians, Tamander, Valachevic, Bordolo are all pending UFAs. Do we just let them go and bring in some crappy players to fill out a roster? I don't know, but there's a, still a couple RFAs at least to sign, but most of these guys seem to be UFAs at the moment. Goalie-wise, uh, Lasik's probably gone because Dan Ellis is likely going to play in the AHL next season, my guess. Yeah, and I might have to trade away Chris Mason just because Sedin's definitely getting close to being AHL ready too. So, we'll have to think about that with the AHL system as well. So there is our contract situation. The final thing, the draft class. Let me go to the draft board. Where are we drafting again? Because I don't remember. We're drafting at 23. We also have multiple third rounders, multiple fourth rounders, multiple fifth rounders. So we could hypothetically move up in the draft as well. Because we could probably package like multiple thirds to get a higher second, package those seconds to get a higher first. Or we move multiple fifths to get a multiple fourths, to move multiple thirds, etc. So, right now we're projected to get somebody like a Franz Nielsen, Keith Ballard, or a Paul Ranger. Which is not really exactly the best of players. So, moving up might be great. There is also Mark Giordano who is supposed to go second round. And I know that I made him a low elite, so I would probably take him with our late first round pick. If we decide to keep our late first round pick instead. Because Mark Giordano, obviously a great defenseman. But if we wanted to move up and grab somebody else, we could definitely do that as well. So, uh, this Jenner guy is likely headed to Atlanta, which means Rick Nash is likely headed to the Tampa Bay Lightning, which will be interesting. Duncan Keith projected to go third. And then there's a couple generated guys, of course. Pierre Marc Bouchard's up there, Jay Bowmeister. This is definitely not one of the strongest draft classes, so it doesn't matter really if we move up, I feel like. But if we dra uh, draft Mark Giordano, that would be probably good. We could probably also trade some of our excess picks for next year's draft. Because that would be good. Getting the excess picks, uh, or using those excess picks to get higher up picks for 2003. That's probably something I would lean towards. But I definitely think Giordano would be my first round selection. Because we do need defensive prospects. And I'm pretty sure I made him have some good offensive attributes. So I think he could definitely help us out. Uh, from the back end, which is kind of something we definitely need help with. So, anyways, guys, that's going to do it for this episode of our Nashville Predators Throwback 2000 Franchise Mode. So, in next episode, we will take it to the 2002 NHL Draft. As we look to get some more prospects in, we'll probably end up trading away some players on our roster as well to try and make our team a little bit worse. Obviously, because we don't really want to make it back to the playoffs again next year, we want to have maybe some lottery picks for the 03 draft. And then obviously after the 03 draft, we could start building up and getting this team into being playoff contender-wise. So, anything down below, and I'll see you guys next time.